Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Um, as you mentioned, I'm Derek Newell. I'm a serial healthcare entrepreneur, mostly in healthcare services and technology. I've been in the Bay Area my whole career. I went to Berkeley and sort of never left. Um, quick, just background on me. So, for those of you who are thinking about becoming entrepreneurs, this presentation is really geared for you more than for um, maybe other people who just want to learn. I'm happy to talk about the companies in more detail. This is very much from the point of view of, a, um, of an entrepreneur, like what's an entrepreneur going to do? Um, so, you know, my background, biochemistry, I sort of freaked out when I the Peace Corps and lived overseas for about four years, which was a lot of fun. Uh, I was actually lived in South Africa during the transition from apartheid to not having apartheid when Nelson Mandela was elected, so that was interesting. I came back into MBA, MPH, and then I have sort of four um, milestones. I worked for Brown and Tillman Medical Group here in the city, and it really taught me sort of a on the ground medicine. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about that one, but uh, the other ones are more interesting. Life Masters was a disease management company. I affectionately call it a, a NAGA nurse call center model. We would analyze the claims, find out you have diabetes, call you at dinner, and tell you you had diabetes and stop eating that cake. Um, and then tell you you should just get your, get your shit together, basically. But that was, ooh, am I not supposed to cuss? This is going to be on YouTube, but get it together. Um, so then I went, for health, I went to work for a company called Health Hero. I'll talk about that. And then Jeff Castlight's been the last six years of my life. So kind of my philosophy, I think as an entrepreneur, it's important to have a philosophy. It's important to have a point of view. Um, you know, might be just I want to make a lot of money, but for most of us in healthcare, that's not the simple answer, right? It's that for me, it's like I think I went overseas, joined the Peace Corps. For those of you who don't know what the Peace Corps is, it's, you know, the government go make peace in the world through, you, through foreign aid, right? Um, and so we are the most liberal part of the foreign aid group. And what I realized was the most impactful things that the US government was doing overseas was helping people smart, start small businesses, right? Small businesses had a better impact on health and education and the wealth of a community than anything else. Give somebody 50 bucks to start an egg farm and start you know, selling eggs to the community, their kids were going to school in six months. It was amazing. And so I sort of came back and said, I want to be an entrepreneur. Um, and you can make a huge impact, but you, know, you got to believe. Being an entrepreneur is really, really hard you're going to get rejected all the time. <laughs> and, and you have to just believe in yourself more than anybody else believes in you. Um, it's really critical to work on something that's important um, because people don't listen to you if you don't work on something that's important. Like we saw a couple of uh, startups today that are working on things that are really important. Stress is huge. And the daily liquidity and the lack of compliance with clinical guidelines and the overwhelm of doctors is huge. So um, do something important. And then I can't stress enough about the team. You got to build a good team and good teams are hard to build. The other two more things is I know we all get we all get wrapped up and when we get funders and everybody wrapped up um, good good venture capitalists will realize that if you have a good idea and a great team they'll fund you before a great idea and a mediocre team. Like execution is really really important. There's tons of good ideas out there that never get off the ground. And you have to really focus on execution. Like, I don't propose to be the smartest person in the world, but I'm really good at executing an idea and getting a team together to do it well. Um, and this is a little bit about teams. Great teams win. Um, one thing about great teams is they argue a lot. If your team is arguing, it's making you uncomfortable. You probably need to, like, be okay with people arguing. Not coming to decisions is different than arguing. Arguing and coming to decisions. Um, we care about each other. We tell each other how they feel. Um, we do what it takes to get aligned because one of the things that kills many startups is lack of focus. Try to do too much, try to boil the ocean, can't figure out what's important to a few customers and get it right. Um, and focus is just, I can't express enough for entrepreneurs how important that is and how hard it is. Right, because you have many people coming at you giving their opinion, which, <clears throat> um, you know, it's just their opinion, right? If you're a good entrepreneur, you'll listen to them and then you'll test it against what you know. Um, so I'm going to talk about Life Masters um, and uh, really quick, but this is more internal innovation. I joined the company really early. It was a MD founder. He was um, Dr. David Goodman. He's the founder of the Pulse Oximeter. And he said, if we manage people with CHF, we can do really well. I, it was a tech-enabled disease management company, so I'll talk more about what that means. I was, I, hired, I was hired as the VP of product, marketing and analytics. Later became the chief marketing officer. Basically, I built the products that the doctors and the nurses and the patients used. And 
you know, analyze the outcomes and everybody wants to know like, what does your product do? How does it work? And what outcomes does it get? So that's marketing and healthcare basically is how, what does it do? How does it work? And what do you get? And um, we raised about $40 million. When I started in 2000, it was about a $3 million a year company. And when I left in 2006, it was about a $170 million a year company. So it grew very, very rapidly. And we sold it in 2006 to another company for about $300 million. So it's going to be interesting because I see some of the guidelines from Health Pals in here. This was a very early version of that. Um, so we called it the active intervention model. And this is from a presentation in June 2004. But basically, we were the first company to put an online portal so you could communicate with a nurse and manage your diabetes online. And we integrated it with Roche diabetes meters. And we would ask you questions about how you were doing. We'd send all that data back. We'd analyze it through a bunch of algorithms. If something was going wrong, and this was for CHF diabetes, the big five, like CHF diabetes, COPD, hypertension, or CAT and asthma. Um, we later expanded it to more conditions. But you could see your nurse. You could interact with your nurse. Your nurse could see you. If something was going wrong, like your biometrics or your question or your feeling, like how you felt was getting out of whack, she'd call you and talk about it. And when we started, we had what I call a curriculum-based model. So on the, on the left-hand side up there is we stratified people, we analyzed people, we stratified them to high, medium, low. And basically, if you were in high and medium, you got into the curriculum model. If you were low, you got into, like, we mailed you a couple things. This was back before most people had email. And basically, we said, you have diabetes, thou shalt. Understand your A1C, understand that you need to get a retinal exam, understand this, that, and the other thing. And of course, for the physicians in the room, you've seen one diabetic, you've seen one diabetic, right? It's just impossible to sort of um, generalize that. And what we would get is some people would drop out, some people thought it was great, some people who were in control, who were in the program, didn't need to be in the program. So what we basically did is take the clinical guidelines, analyze the claim data, score everybody against the clinical guidelines. Um, and what we were trying to do is enhance ROI, right? Because putting everybody through a curriculum-based model with no outcomes meant we were spending a lot of nurse time, we were spending a lot of physician time, when we didn't need to. So we wanted to make the most efficient use of um, resources to minimize intervention costs. And we wanted to sustain, increase the probability of sustained behavior change and outcomes. If I'm talking to you about A1C and you have this down and you know all day long exactly how to manage your blood sugar, you're going to get bored and hang up the phone and you're not going to take the next call, right? But if you're, if I say, if I give you a little sort of questionnaire about how you do you understand A1C and you score perfectly, I don't need to go through that module with you. I'm not going to keep you engaged anymore. And so what we did is we took the clinical indicators, but we took it one step further. And we said, clinical indicators, they're not all the same, right? They're not all the same. Like if a CHF patient gains five pounds in two days, that's really, really bad, right? If an A1C is nine, that's bad, but it's not really, really bad. They're not gonna die. If their glucose is 300, that's really, really bad. And so you need to like, you need to have a system of importance and severity, right? So how important is something is along the, the y-axis. Um, so less clinical, critical indicator to a more critical indicator. And then it's like, okay, what's the value, right? Is it, is it really bad or is it a little bit bad? And so we had the system of scoring. So we analyzed all the claims data. We had about 50 million patients worth of data. We analyzed all the claims data and we presented a score for each person. But this is a little hard to read, but the score was not just an aggregate score, but it's here's what you do. So in each of those little boxes where the colors are, the fives, the fours, the threes, the nurse would open it up, get on the phone with the person that they knew exactly what to do. Like this person had not weighed themselves, and this person has CHF. Well, the most important thing I needed the nurse to do was to get the person to step on the scale and put in their weight because that's how I could keep them out of the hospital. This person also isn't on, the, on a beta blocker. They needed to be on a beta blocker, right? And so the nurse or the doctor, the, this was the nurse tool. So we had patient tools and we had nurse tools. This was the nurse's tool to open up and then she would click on that, on that weight scale thing and then she'd have a curriculum and she'd have pamphlets and brochures and videos and all this stuff that she could send to a patient to help them understand the importance of weight gain. It wasn't just like, here's weight gain, here's the problem, go off and try to figure out how to solve it with this patient. There was a guided sort of set of clinical tools that would help her that she could use over the phone as well as send links to or even in those days send mailers to. 
So this was pretty revolutionary, and this is why we grew so much. Because when you talk to a doctor and say, I'm going to put everybody through a curriculum on diabetes, and I'm going to teach everybody about diabetes, that's really different than saying, for each specific person, I'm going to look at exactly where they're struggling, and I'm going to fix that clinical problem with the delivery system. So the second thing is, we worked a lot with physicians. And you know, physicians that were just as overwhelmed then as they are now. And getting a random piece of paper through the fax from a disease management company, like who's got time to look at that, right? And so what we did, we got our payers to put reimbursement behind it. So that helped a little bit. But still, when you get three of these faxes a week, you're like, what the hell is this thing? So we had a very strong physician outreach program. But the key thing was to make the information as consumable as possible, as quickly as possible by the physician, right? So on the top is the drugs. Um, and the red is what's wrong, the trend charts are there, and in the box right below is like, what's the nursing note? And it wasn't telling them what to do, but it was an observation. The doctors knew what to do. And they ha we had a second page to this, just because, uh, which I don't show here, but just because doctors need you to know we basically listed the clinical guidelines that this was built off of so that they could think that we weren't complete quacks. Um, and then I just wanted to show this for anybody who puts Google or Amazon as part of their presentation, we're going to be the Google, Amazon, Uber of healthcare for this reason. We used to do it in 2004 as well. So we talked about you know prioritization of a large amount of data and personalize and update a profile. And so that's just kind of interesting and trivial. But that company grew really well. What I knew was it wasn't close enough to the delivery system, right? Those are hard, right? You're not nurses calling doctors and calling patients from a call center in Indiana trying to get them to change behavior, both the physicians and the, the patients. It works for about 25% of the patients, but 75% of the patients, it doesn't work. So there's a big gap. So then another type of, so that was internal innovation. Like I didn't invent this company. I didn't do anything. I just sort of built it um, or helped to build it. Uh, and I changed the way we thought about our clinical model. I'm not a doctor, but there were lots of smart doctors and nurses there. And I just talked to them a lot and listened to them and said, what do you do with the patient when they come into your practice? And I had worked at a medical group before, and I have an MPH in biostatistics, so I, I was pretty well versed in how this would work. The second company was business model innovation. So the second company was the first company to ever get an internet connected medical device approved by the FDA. So back, that's, that's how old I am. There's a long time ago where the FDA had never approved a medical device with an internet connection in it. We're the very first one to do it. I became the CEO. It was founded for a few years before I got there. Um, we raised about $100 million. Um, before I got there, they raised about $80 million of that, and it only had $3 million in revenue. Um, I grew it to about $100 million in revenue in four years, uh, and we sold it to Bosch in 2008 for about $150 million. So the early investors didn't make anything, but the later investors did. Um, the big thing about this one is it was started as a video game. It's called Health Hero. So it was a Nintendo or Atari platform video game for kids with type 1 juvenile diabetes. And it was a, to teach them how to like, go out and kill the bad sugar molecules in your blood. Um, but that didn't take off. And we developed a, a, this thing called the Health Buddy, which was basically a remote monitor you put in patients' home. They would be able to go home instead of going to the skilled nursing facility. We'd connect all their medical devices to it. They would communicate with it, and we would ask them surveys. And the reason there's four buttons is these were frail, elderly, senior people, and you basically ask them a question with four answers. And they, those buttons are far apart, and they're big, right? And so designed for the population that was in it. Um, so when I got there, they're like, we sell hardware, right? This is 2006. They're like, we sell hardware. We're like Dell. Like, this thing costs us 350 bucks, and we sell it for 2,500. That's great. We can make lots of money. It was a proven business model. Um, Cash occurs, you build a machine, you sell it, you get the profit, it's good. The cash flow model works. Um, but it had problems. Like, if I wanted to sell 100 devices for, to somebody, they had to go get a $2.5 million budget approved. Like, that's, or, you know, that's hard, right? If I, not 100, that was, yeah. So it's hard. It was a capital purchase sale. The hard, hardware manufacturing at, at small scales is really difficult. And so when you don't have high volumes, Manufacturing medical devices is really, really tough if you don't man manufacture hundreds of thousands of them. And there was no recurring revenue. So if somebody pulled an order, my quarter could go to hell or go up or go down based on the whims of somebody's budget. And it was really hard for me to manage a customer, a, a, 
a company for investors to invest in. Because if I would, had this great fundraising going, and the, the, you know, the quarter before the fundraising, I lost a big deal with somebody, and my revenue went way down instead of way up, like, they're like, oh, this company's not growing anymore, and I would get completely crammed down and screwed, or the financing would go awry. Um, so basically, we also had about 200 patents. We had the first artificial pancreas patents, which we licensed to Abbott, and we had all of these patents that these a bunch of really smart, crazy engineers had come up with, and we patented every idea anybody had in the company, whether or not it was related to remote behavior monitoring. So we, uh, there was an argument, shut down the business, shut down the hardware side of the business, and just licensed patents. And I'm like, I don't think that's the right thing to do. It's really high margin, but that was the world. It's really, really, really expensive to enforce your patents. It's super expensive. Um, and when you win, it's great. And when you lose, you just lost $5 million in legal fees for over five years. Um, so then I really thought about it. I talked to our customers like, we actually sell an outcome and a service. We don't sell, we don't sell a product. And so um, if you look over here, we had all of these devices that connected to our Health Hero platform. And then we had all of these services. We had a clinical analytics engine. We had a scripting platform, which at, figured out which questions to ask which people. We had a clinical protocol engine, which figured out what are the protocols for the different disease states that would then drive the questions. Um, we had a loyalty engine to keep people coming back and doing it. And then we had, on the right-hand side, we didn't have nurses. We didn't have nurses, like in the call center. We just had doctors, and we integrated this right into their EMR systems. Um, so that was what we sold. And at the end of the day, we needed scale because if you don't, if you want to integrate with EMR systems, you got to get scale. You can't go dock to dock integrating with every little EMR system. It was way harder then than it is now, and it's still hard. Um, so there were risk-bearing entities because if a, if you're not a risk-bearing entity, you have no incentive to do remote patient monitoring. You're not going to do it because you get paid every time the patient comes in, and you don't get paid to keep them out of your office. Um, we also needed people who were had their hair on fire, so VA, Kaiser. And home health agencies were our biggest customers. So why home health agencies? Because in the early 2000s, CMS changed the way they pay home health agencies. They used to pay them by the visit, and then they said, you guys are just going crazy. You're visiting everybody all the time. You're wasting a whole bunch of money. I'm going to pay you 2500 per patient. You have to do five visits. And if you do more than 13 and you justify it right, I'll pay you more. But between five and 13, you're at risk. And so home health agencies were all about putting these devices with people. So what did elephants want? So this is a business model innovation. They want low total cost of ownership. They want turnkey solutions. They want better outcomes. They want improved efficiency. Um, why would we go after them? Because they're big. They have lots of patients, lots of recurring revenue. They have a problem. And they benefit from nurse efficiency. So they would, if they're at risk and they have nurses, we have double the way to make ROI for them. We can make the nurses more efficient. So a case manager managing CHF patients without the health buddy could manage about 30 to 70 um, CHF patients at, the, at this time in 2006 and 7. With a health buddy, they could manage 250 patients. So we would be able to somewhere between you know, 3x and 8x the nurse productivity. So the solution must address the barriers. I won't go through this but entirely, but we decided what are we going to do for them? What are we going to enable them to do? And what are we not going to do? This is about focus. Because every customer was asking us to do different things. So it's like, we're going to build a device. We're not going to. Some people were like, well, just help us build a device. Consult to us to build a device. It's like, we're not going to do that. Um, program design, patient selection. We needed to provide them with the algorithms. We don't want them to pick the wrong patients. Um, what turned out to be really important was patient recruitment and patient training. We really needed to lean in and help them. It wasn't a service we provided, but we leaned in and helped them design their program because the change management and workflows, if they didn't get them right, they'd never get patients on the system. Um, and we also did logistics and refurbishment. For those of you who are familiar with medical devices, when you take it from one patient to the next, you have to clean it in an FDA-compliant way, eliminate all the patient data, sanitize it, do some things. And doing that at volume, doing that, you know, we would, they would end up with these things in closets. We just gave them a FedEx envelope. They sent it to our factory. We could do it for eight bucks, and we would charge them 20 bucks, and they would just do that all day long. So what did we do? Well, this was, you recognize the, the old Motorola Razor smartphone. Well, I was like, we should just switch to a service model. So we don't sell them the device at all. We gave them, like, the COGS was, was um, $350. I'm like, pay me $50 up front to $100 up front. 
and then may pay me $50 a month to $100 a month, depending if you got peripherals. And the warranty is built into the device, the device breaks, just send it back to me. Tell me you've sent it back to me, give me the tracking number, and I'll send you a device FedEx the same day, so tomorrow you're not out, your patient doesn't delay waiting to get that one back, right? So warranties were built in, refurbishment service I already talked about, we did enablement materials, we provided phone technical support, we did webinars and trainings, we had massive growth. Like we went from $3 million a year to like 100 million in four years. And we, were, we just took over the industry. Like nobody else, and the reason this worked was it's hard to go from a cash model where, so just think about the economics of it. I'm, I build a health buddy for 300, I sell it for 2,500. I put a little bit over two grand in my pocket, right? I do that over and over again and my cash flow is good. It doesn't bleed me too bad. Now. I pay $350 and it takes me four months to recoup the $350, right? So now, and then I, that causes massive growth. Well, what's that do? I got, I'm burning cash like crazy because I have to hire all these people to support all these customers. I have to build all these devices without getting the revenue back. So nobody else could make the pivot with me. I got my investors to put $20 million in to make this pivot, but no other competitor could make the pivot with us. And by the time they saw it was working, we were already in the lead. Right, so that's, and it was a risk. People are like, how do you know it was gonna work? Like, I didn't know it was gonna work. I hoped it would work, I thought it would work. I talked to people, I asked them questions, would you buy more if this, this, this? And I really, I talked to like 100 different customers, so I was pretty sure it would work. But people tell you all the time what they wanna hear. Oh yeah, I'll buy that, I'll buy that. I'd pay 20 bucks a month for it. And then they don't, right? So, so it was, I bet my sort of CEO life on that one, on that one. So the last company, I know I'm talking fast, I don't wanna keep people too long. Um, the last company was Jif. So this is a company is the only one I was a co-founder of. Um, it's a digital health platform. I'll talk about it a little bit more. We raised about $70 million. We sold it um, a couple of years later for 150. Um, we sold it to a company where we took all stocks so that we're still riding that investment, see how it goes. Um, and I'm the president of Castlelight uh, today, which means I run R&D and, and sales and marketing. Um, so this one was a true, so I was trying, when this thing came out, I went to my boss at Bosch where I had sold the medical device company to and I said, this is like, this is, you don't need remote patient monitoring devices anymore. This is it, right? This, this is the thing. He looked at me like I was crazy. Um, he's like, oh no, you guys in Silicon Valley, everybody's gonna use the flip phones. Like, nah, no one's gonna have a smartphone. Just like you weirdos out there in California. Cause it was a German company. And I was like, you don't understand. He's like, well, even if all you young people buy it, us old people, we're gonna stick with the Blackberries. Um, so, <laughs> and, and that's only the business people. Everybody else is just, we're even gonna stick with landlines. I'm just like, you know. So I, so I was like, I could not convince them to build a platform that was independent of the devices because Bosch is a manufacturing company at the end of the day. So I went out and I was trying to raise money on putting a remote patient platform on this device. And it was 2011, early, early 2011, and no one, people thought I was crazy. They were like, old people are never gonna use smartphones. It's like, you know, this is a Medicare thing. No one's gonna pay for it. The government's not gonna reimburse it. You know, now there's Livongo and Omada and Gluco and like Hello Heart and all these companies that are doing it, but I couldn't convince anybody to do it at that time. So another group of entrepreneurs who were consumer health people who couldn't they were consumer technology people. They had built consumer technology companies like Goodreads, anybody know Goodreads? They sold to Amazon, um, which was an online reading club. They built a company called Wonder Hill Games, which they sold to Kabam. So they were really well-known um, consumer tech guys. Like my, one of my co-founders now runs product for Facebook Messenger. So all of you probably have it on your phone. He's the head of product for messaging at Facebook. So really, really amazing guys, but I didn't know them. And this VC said, if the three of you guys get together, and these guys couldn't spell HIPAA. Like they were like, what's it, like HIPAA? Like what, what are you talking about? We just want to do cool stuff in healthcare because we're tired of building games. So the guy said, if you three get together and figure out a good idea, then we'll fund you. We figured out three, one good idea and two bad ideas. And we didn't, we kind of knew which one was which, but, but this was the first company where I founded it and we just did not know what the hell we were doing. First we built the GIF pad, which was doctor enabled, 
You know, nobody remembers what the doctor tells them in the doctor visit. 50% of that knowledge is lost, and there's a bunch of studies around that. So we built a pad where the doctor could re record the conversation, the voice would get recorded on the iPad, would come up all of these clinical images, he could draw or she could draw on them, write notes on them, that could be saved to the cloud and they could share it with their loved ones. And we got 4,000 doctors on it almost immediately and there was like 1,000 doctors that used it religiously. Like, and so we raised money on that because we're like, every doctor in America is gonna need this and two problems. The high tech act came out, so everybody got lost in EMR and implementation. And then we found out that doctors actually don't like it because they're terrified of the liability of having that data out there from their interaction in the world. And number two is the only people who are using it were residents. The, 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 it, the people running the resident program would make the residents use it when they couldn't be in the room with them so that they could watch it later. And the residents, they loved it. And it's like, that's not a business. So then we were like, oh, diabetes prevention got Diabetes prevention got a code, and it's going to be this next huge thing. So we built an online platform for United Healthcare for diabetes prevention. So the first one cost me $2 million in cash, ended up with zero. Second one cost me $3 million in cash, sold it for like a million, so net $2 million. And it was an online SaaS platform for patients to go through the Project Not Mean guidelines, which is the diabetes prevention guidelines. That was United's program was called Project Not Me. Total waste of money again. Um, and so I'm running out of money because I'd raised seven and a half million dollars on kind of a general set of ideas. I'm running out of money and I'm like, you know, this is bad. <laughs> this is my second stint to CEO, it's not going well. So, so then I'm like, I don't know what to do. So I put my engineers on building all kinds of consumer apps. So we built like a food app, we built a blood pressure app, we built a walk with friends app, we built all these consumer apps, not because I thought we'd become a consumer company because I had no idea what I was gonna do. Um, and I built, I spent like another million dollars on that. And I didn't tell my board I don't know what I'm doing. Of course, I'm telling them like everything's great and I know exactly what we're doing and you know, got my shit together and I'm sorry again for again. Yeah. But I know what I'm doing. But this is where, you know, and I was talking to people and we had an idea that was really big. But it's hard to do a really big idea when you don't have capital. So um, our really big idea was there was this digital health explosion of direct direct to consumer apps, devices, and services like this thing. There was like the largest growing app category was health, right? This is when Strava and run, you know, what's it called? There's all the, you know, there's Fitbit and there's all the devices, but there were all of the applications that use the, the like Strava that use the, the GPS to map your walks and you could do all kinds of crazy stuff. And those categories and food trackers and blood pressure trackers, they were going, going like gangbusters and people were spending tons of money on them. And so what we decided was, what we could do is we could disrupt the way self-insured employers thought about benefit design and wellness by building a platform that would link all the stuff that were consumers using to your benefit design. Um, so, because the employer experience was this, they had all of these digital health companies who were struggling and every board member said, hey, I need you to go talk to self-insured employers because you're not making enough money, so have an employer strategy. And employers were getting inundated with thousands of companies calling them saying, have I got a solution for you for these 50 people or 100 people or 1,000 people in your population? And so what we realized is we could build a platform that all of those companies plugged into and that then, if you use those devices, apps, and services, I could change your premiums. And I could change how much money I deposited to your HSA. And I could change your whole fundamental incentive for how you purchase healthcare from your employer. And so that basic idea took off. Um, and basically what we did is we said, we have solutions for people who need to stay healthy, access care, and manage conditions. Um, and then we took a big data engine. We had um, 8 million lives on it, and we said, what are the user preferences? What are the user behaviors? We got data from the health insurance companies. We got data from all of the devices, apps, and services. So a requirement was when you had a device or app or service and you linked it, in order to get your premium differential, you had to connect these devices to our platform, and those, platform, those device partners and app partners agreed to send data into the platform on your usage on the platform. You do this all the time with Google and Facebook. Every time you do sign in with Facebook and you don't read all that fine text, you're basically sending a bunch of data to that other third-party provider and vice versa. Built the same kind of model. 
And then basically what we would do is we would recommend what should this person be? Should they be in the sleep program? Should they be in the stress program? Should they be in the diabetes program? Are they in the program? Should we give them a $100 premium or $150 premium or $20 premium or $0 premium if they were doing really well and they had a really expensive condition? And so basic, and we made that for employers. So we, we were able to brand it for employers. We were able to implement their plan design. So plan designs and employers are really complicated. We were able to implement, we built an engine to implement their plan design. And then we took this ecosystem. First we did it with all the, the direct to consumer stuff. And then we realized they were just as overwhelmed by the, the B2B players who were B2B to C players really. And so what we did was we started reselling all of these players and we built a marketplace. So an employer could say, oh, you have 100 companies and I can buy any one of them through you. Give me one of those, one of those, one of those, and one of those. And then all of the contracting, all of the security requirements, all of the liability ran through our company. And so we built a network effect with hundreds of companies that got the, most of their revenue from us, through us. Because um, they would charge us, you know, they, we, we would charge the company five bucks and we would take a dollar and we pay them four dollars just like an app store and all day long everybody loved it because these guys got easy sales they weren't part of that chaos and the employer was like I don't have to deal with a whole bunch of vendors I get I get 20 vendors through you for each segment of my population and I don't have to manage them that's fantastic um, so you know this was the castlight ecosystem we helped them simplify procurement <clears throat> We did these deep data exchanges. We had an open architecture where other people could integrate with our APIs, and we did all the vendor management. And so I guess the theme is you got to think holistically about more than the technology. I, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name from Health Pals, but I, I, you mentioned um, why don't you do it to individual practices and integrate with the EMRs, right? Well, it's a business model problem. He can't, right? It costs too much money. They call the customer acquisition cost, right? So it's like, so you have to expand, but you have to think about the problems that your customer's facing and the money that they're making, and then how do you design a solution to optimize your business? And at different stages, you can do different things. Like as we scaled and as we raised money, we integrated deeper and deeper and deeper with more and more partners. And there were partners, you know, at a small scale when we had like three customers, like I'm really going to integrate with you for three customers? Like, no, I'm not going to do that. But when we had 200 customers, like there were people knocking at our door and we had to build an API and just say build to it, right? Because we, we couldn't do it anymore. Um, so every one of those was really different. This was more of a wellness platform, but it became a navigation platform because we took, the other thing is you have to find a budget. So we stole the wellness budget, repurposed it, um, and basically said, employees are paying for this. So if you take a little bit of your wellness budget, you subsidize the device, they'll pay for the rest of the device. They'll be really happy about it. And then you'll have this new kind of corporate wellness benefit design. Um, and it's, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was really different. Um, we had this idea from the beginning. I wasted like $10 million playing around on other stuff, but we had this idea, but it was web-based. It wasn't mobile first. Um, and so sometimes, when you're an entrepreneur, what I learned is when you found something, you need to be willing to like iterate on your ideas as you get market feedback because sometimes you start with something that, you know, is a good idea and you want to iterate on it and sometimes you start with something that's a bad idea. But if you just keep going at it, um, you'll get it. And this was, this was more the traditional Silicon Valley iterate till you find something startup and it was so stressful. Like it was like the worst. At the beginning, it was the worst. At the end, it was the best because it, it's probably going to be the biggest company that I built um, because at Castlight, it's, you know, they've got hundreds of customers. Anthem has thousands of customers that we're rolling this out to over the next three years. Um, but it was, it was, it was the most stress inducing, gave me an ulcer, um, which is fun. Um, but it was hard during those days when I really didn't know if the company was going to make it and I didn't know which idea to exactly implement. And that was where focus came in and sort of had to just jump off the bridge and try this one. So anyway, that's my story about what I've done. I guess I'm happy to answer questions and the lessons are more at the beginning than at the end is like focus. You got to believe in yourself because there's going to be times where no one else is going to believe in you, right? It's going to get dark. Uh, and I call it walking through the valley of darkness. You just have to get there to get to the other side of any successful startup. So, yeah. Just a live master, how did you market and advance customer or patient engagement? 
Um, so I had, a, I had an engagement team that at the beginning was like five people on a call center calling people up. Because back then, people weren't online. We didn't have emails for people. We were just dialing for dollars. So it was very much like a telemarketing organization. And at the end, when we were $170 million in revenue, I had like 150, in, 150 people in our enrollment engagement. Like literally, we called people at dinner. Like, so it was, just, it was just brute force, old days telemarketing, right? Now, today, it's all digital. We do Facebook ads, Google ads. It's all telemarketing. It's all digital marketing today. Yeah. But other questions? Yeah. Um, yeah, you either have to be slow to hire, you know, you, you have to, you have, this is going to sound really, so this is going to sound really bad, potentially, but it's not. You have to curate your team. It's like you, you have a group of people that you get in and you do your best to pick them, right? Your absolute best to pick the right people. Um, and if you're really good at hiring and you do a really good job, then you don't have to do the other part, which is less pleasant. But if somebody doesn't fit, you have to get rid of them. You have to. You just have to fire them. It's like the most important thing you can do as a founder is make sure that the underperformers on your team or the people who you just don't really have a job for anymore or you hired them for this, but now you need somebody for that and they really can't do that. You just have to get them out of the company because I always say this, the people who can jump off the, the people who can swim are going to jump off the boat first. And so if you have really, really talented people and you have mediocre people, the talented people are going to leave because the mediocre people aren't carrying their weight. So if you want to hire a great team, you have to, you have to have that process of managing people out. If you do it brutally and capriciously, like you don't think it through and you don't if you fire the smart ones instead of the mediocre ones, you'll establish a culture of fear. So you have to be really careful about making sure that everybody understands that you're a performance-based company, right? You're a performance-based culture that still cares about its people, and that's a tricky thing to do. But I'm, not, I'm a good hire. I'm not a great hire. I don't know how to interview someone and be like, that's the best person at that job I've ever seen. So I get like a third of the people wrong, and I just got to figure out how to get them out quickly without them doing too much damage, right? So. I don't know anybody who's like perfect hire. You're just not, right? You can't do that. So that's, and then have high expectations. But then it gets, it's hard in a startup. So then be a cheerleader. Have high expectations, but be a cheerleader. Like be a coach. Like, you know, I love you and you can do better. You know, basically that's what you tell your employees a lot, the best ones. Yeah. 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 Everybody overestimates the value they bring to the company. Yeah. And you there's nothing worse than that in the sale of a company because inevitably when you sell a company, everybody kind of figures out what everybody else made. And they're like, he made more than me? Are you kidding me? Really? Like, I was here first, and I did this, this, and, like, they go crazy. Um, and you've got to be conscious of that, though. Like, you, as, as a founder, as a CEO, you really have to be conscious of the fact that you want to you, you pay for value that people have created. Um, and it's hard. I don't have a simple, like, answer for you. I wish I did. Like, but I had three different scenarios. I took over from Dr. David Goodman in the first company, and he stayed there for a while. And I was young. I didn't get a ton of equity. Eventually, I became the chief marketing officer. I got more equity. But I was really early in my career. And my equity stake was always low for the position I was in, which, which was OK. It wasn't like they gave me 10 shares and they should have given me 10,000. They gave me 5,000 when I should have gotten 10. But, but for my early stage, that was OK. And then um, on the second one, the Health Hero one, basically the CEO got fired and I took over, so he never talked to me again. Um, and I had to replace his whole team. And the third one, I co-founded it with these other guys, and I just got lucky on that one. Um, but it's complicated. When you guys co-founded, how did you guys know how to uh, divvy up? Was it just evenly? We just did a third, a third, a third, yeah. And that was just sort of like the easiest way to do it. And 
I put in way more work than they did at the end of the day. And they helped us at certain milestones where I might have failed, the company might have failed. Like I feel really good about how it turned out. But they bailed out on me after three years because they're like, we're consumer guys, you got it. Once we figured out the idea that was going to work and we got our Series B, they're like, yeah, we're out. And I'm just like, you know, go work at Facebook and, you know, eat free food all day. And I'm busting my ass over here trying to make this company work. <laughs> yeah. Last question. Okay. What, what, what advice do you have for a physician who is currently practicing, has an idea, and is kind of contemplating So I know a few physician entrepreneurs, and I know a few physician wannabe entrepreneurs. Um, and the biggest difference between the wannabe entrepreneurs and the real entrepreneurs is the wannabe entrepreneurs, they make a lot of money, but they have a high burn rate. You cannot, like the stress of having financial strain when you're trying to do a new company, like you can't do it. Like it's, it'll overwhelm you, you'll get a divorce, the whole life will fall apart. Like it's not a good idea. You know, you have to get yourself financially prepared. Like for me, every time I do a startup, like my income drops by like 75%. But I, I structure my life and my income and the money that I make in a way that I can go and take a dive off the deep end again and get paid, you know, 25% of what I was making last year or next year. So I can do this, right? So I think that's the biggest thing. And then the other thing is a lot of people, doctors are generally super smart, trained as individual contributors, right? That your training is you passed the board exam, not all of you in this room. You didn't do it collaboratively like you passed it. And you passed the test, and you passed this test, and you took your MCATs. So it reinforces this really independent point of view and you have to be able to collaborate to be successful in a business venture. And sometimes the best thing the doctor can do is be like, I have this great idea. I've got some IP on it. I'm going to give it to some great business people, and I want 10% or 15%. They'll want 80%, but it's like that's, you know, the IP is only 20% of a company. So sometimes the best thing you can do is give it to someone who can make it into something big. That's risky, but there, there are downside protections. Like you can say, if it fails, I get the IP back, right? I don't own 20% of the IP. I have rights to the IP if the whole thing dissolves at 100%, but I'll put it in for 20% of the company. And, but you want someone who's not just going to bring, oh, I'm going to take 80% and I'm going to go try to, you know, like you need to bring money or something. You need to bring some real, you know, don't give it away for nothing. But that's kind of what I would say is really think about, are you collaborative? Can you work well on a team? And can you deal with the financial uncertainty of a startup? It's hard, right? Especially the first one that you do. Okay. I'd say the other thing that physicians are generally are risk averse. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so it's it's scary, right? It's scary. Like, you know, I've been really, really lucky. Like every one of them has worked. I've never had one in the middle that didn't work. But let me tell you, every time I didn't think that, that one was gonna work. It's, it's nerve wracking and so um, I think you have to be able to tolerate the risk and you have to be able to pick yourself up every time you get knocked down, right? You just have to be able to, and you don't have to do it right away. You can lay there for a day, but you can't lay there for two months, right? Um, so. Yeah. I know most of your like, phenomenal price of what you raised. Mm -hmm. Well, the first one we raised 40 and we sold it for 300. So that one was like 10, um, not 10, not quite 10, but eight. Um, the second one I took, yeah, so, so it's, um, no. I, every time I think about raising money though, I think I have to get the investors two to three X over one to two years, right? So that's how I think about it. Every round I do that calculation again. Um, for the last one, we've made another, I don't know, $50 million since then because we did an all stock deal. And the other one was the company was probably worth when I took it over. They had raised $100 million, but that, they had raised $80 million with another person. And, but they had done what's called a recap. Like all of that money had been crammed down back into common stock and it was a, like it was a new startup. And so I got, the, I got those later investors got 7x, right? They got, they, they got not quite 7x, they got price 4x on their money. So I just try to, figure out if the market is there for an exit versus the long-term risk and what's 
what do the people sitting around the table feel like, right? Could, do they have appetite to go long and maybe go zero, or do they have the appetite to kind of get out now? And it's, it's complicated because different people have different fund strategies, and so managing the exit of a company is, is uh, like a graduate course in like m m human psychology. Um, it's nothing to do with financials. It has everything to do with like greed. Um, so, so it's usually kind of complicated, but uh, it doesn't have nothing to do with financials. But it's like every, when there's an exit, like human primordial behavior around did I get enough comes out, and it's very interesting to watch. Um, so it's fun. <laughs> thank what you else? very much. Yeah, thanks. Yeah.